Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Hamza Foy with Ihya 502 podcast. This is the second episode of this podcast. This segment is called Reading Between the Lines, where Mishkat Suleiman and I will kind of take apart books that we have read. We definitely encourage our viewers to consider, you know, reading the books that we um, discuss. We'll also have like intermittent um, sections in which we will, you know, make book suggestions, that sort of thing. So without further ado, Mishkat and I will be discussing The End is Always Near by the author Dan Carlin. The first book that we will be discussing is The End is Always Near by author Dan Carlin. Um, Dan Carlin... He has a series of podcasts, um, one of which is Hardcore History. It's a long-form podcast where he discusses um, anything ranging from the Atomic Age um, to, you know, Roman history. It's a very eclectic but um, well-formatted podcast, and so Mishkat and I, we took turns reading uh, this book. I believe this is the only book that Carlin has authored and published. So what are your initial thoughts? Yeah, um, well, there's there's a lot to dissect out in this book. And so um, I do something almost unforgivable, which Mm. is to read the last page of the book (laughs) (laughs) before I commit to reading the whole book. (laughs) <laughs> and so um, some of the later pages kind of referred to, you know, pandemics and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I wondered when the book was written because the, the, just the parallels between what's happening now versus what he has in the book mm. um, just seemed too spot on. Mm. And so it was interesting to me because this book was published in 2020, but I think like by that point he had already written Mm. and you know formatted and edited everything so it was ready to go right when the pandemic the COVID-19 pandemic hit so gotcha um so for listeners um the way Carlin tackled uh this book um I will admit if you do decide to pick it up or um you decide to preview it it is a little bit all over the place so As the title conveys, um, Carlin is looking at periods of history in which um, people, at least in the context of whatever he's discussing, people thought like the end um, of the world was coming. So he has in this book, um, he discusses like the fall of like ancient civilizations such as the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Um, He has a chapter on the um, Black Death, the uh, bubonic uh, plague in the mid-1300s. And he also discusses um, the Atomic Age and how that, you know, caused a lot of um, fear and trepidation and people across the world, um, you know, because we had finally developed weapons that potentially, uh, could, um, you know, wipe off, um, life on this earth. Um, so you're referring to his chapter about the, uh, bubonic plague, the black death, right? And you're, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he has a pretty extensive section, not just on the bubonic plague, but mm-hmm. that's obviously the the biggest and most horrific one that comes to mind you know there's mm. other other epidemics mm. you know but let's not call them plagues there's other epidemics of other diseases smallpox mm. spanish influenza um you know many many others so mm. um the other thing you know we don't have to move off of the plagues but we, the other thing i wanted to to touch on was the subtitle of the book is apocalyptic moments from the bronze age collapse to the nuclear near misses Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was interesting and it's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to read the book because mm-hmm. obviously it sounds appropriately ominous. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but so then when you kind of get into it, you know, when we think of apocalypse, we think of like just these like 
you know, out of this world, cataclysmic, mm. catastrophic events, like maybe a meteor is going to strike the earth. We've yeah. all seen Deep Impact, right? <laughs> um, so we don't think of like, you know, wars or just mm. routine. I don't want to say routine, right? Because the mm. things that were happening to those societies at that time were obviously horrific. Yeah. But they're more routine. They're more, like, humanized. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that that was interesting. Um, it was an interesting juxtaposition and where he went with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely, you know, notice, and I think Carlin dances around this, but besides the, you know, atomic age, all of these moments where certain civilizations are feeling like the end is near... It's almost just like it's it's only in that region, though. So, like, I'll, I'll give you an example, and this is an example that he doesn't... I wish he did, but he doesn't talk about. Um, you know, the Mongol invasion mm -hmm. was, was considered... So, there's there's a, uh Islamic historian. His name is Ibn Athir. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he lived during the time of the Mongol invasion into the Muslim world. And he wrote... He, he was... It was basically like I, I wish my mother had never, you know, given birth to me, because they perceived at least, you know, him writing and perhaps people during his time. But they they thought that was like yajuj majuj, which for those who are not familiar, like in Islamic eschatology, like the whole concept of the end times. You know, Gog and Magog is one mm -hmm. of those. You know, like it's gonna come at signaling the end. And so when they encountered the Mongols. They were like, uh, you know, this is Yajuj Majuj, strap down, buckle up, pray. It's the end times. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if you had zoomed out, like, you know, on zoomed out scale. on the world scale, mm -hmm. okay, maybe in that part of the world, mm -hmm. okay, it's the end times. But you go to Europe, you go to, you know, the Americas, or, you know, even, you know, East. Asia or Africa, it's like they didn't encounter the Mongols, so it's like you know, life is just going out. It's it's the end it's of operating. life as you know it, but is it the end of life? Yeah, right. Mm. Life is going on in other places. Yeah, because I mean, uh, you know, going back to like the Black Death, you know, within Europe, Asia, and Africa, yes, the Black Death, you know, affected millions. Mm -hmm. But then it's like you go to like. Pacific Islands or the Americas, it's like, you know, birds chirping, you know, <laughs> they had nothing to worry about. Literally birds chirping in the background. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are in the atomic age. You know, there are more and more nations that have atomic weapons. That, I feel like that's kind of like the thing in the background. Not on everybody's mind. I think, you know, if we went back to the 60s or 70s, yes, it would be on everybody's mind. I think nowadays, I don't think... I think it's coming back. Mm. I think we had a short period where maybe it kind of, you know, we filed it away way back in the back mm. and we didn't think about it. I mm. think with recent times yeah. and, you know, the recent scares, and yeah. I think it's slowly kind of coming back into, into just the stark visibility of it's still there. It's yeah. very massively there. It's not mm. going to go away. You know, you, you, you make a really good point because it's like... Anytime you see any sort of unrest, especially in like the largest nations or those nations that we know have, you know, like a nuclear arsenal. Yeah. Now that, that kind of resurfaces like, oh, Lord, like mm -hmm. here we go again. Here we go again. Yeah. Um, anything else like about the book that, that stood out? Yeah. Um, so. Well, as you mentioned, you know, there there is a structure to mm -hmm. the book, right? So the first the first few chapters of the book are devoted to human psychology. Mm -hmm. It extends to how people in earlier times raised their children. You know, it follows from there, from the rise and fall of, um, you know, the Assyrian Empire, the mm -hmm. Roman Empire, and then on to, you know, the epidemics and the, the nuclear age and, mm -hmm. you know, developing air power. Um, yeah. So... So I'm not quite sure. I think it's the first chapter where it says, um, do tough times make for tougher people? Mm -hmm. So I found that really interesting for a lot of reasons um, because 
you know, we can sit here and read about previous times all we want. It doesn't mm. mean that we know how we would live them if it, it was happening to us. Mm. Um, doesn't mean that we know deep inside of the minds of the people who were living it at the time. Um, but it made me think, so does it actually make tougher people or is it mm. people adapting to what is their reality, yeah. right? So if if the reality is and this is maybe like more of an extreme example, if the reality is that the majority of children born in a certain time don't, you know, age past the age of 10, mm. right? Does it make you tougher that, okay, one more child lost? Or is it just that's that's what you have to adapt to? Like, that's the world that's around you. Mm. So I found that that aspect of the psychology really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the way he has the chapters, you know, broken up... Um, Part of it, yeah, it's chronological, um, where he is actually um, observing and commenting on, once again, like times in our history where we mm-hmm. thought the end was near. Um, he did start the book like you described, though. He he talks about, you know, child rearing practices and like what makes um, people or civilization tough. I will admit that was jarring. Um, but I, I, I can understand why he got into the the psychology first. Mm -hmm. Um, that topic though, like what makes people tough? I, I definitely agree with you. It's, it's like humans, you know, we are adaptable, um, to a, to an extent. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if you are living in, you know, harsher times, so to speak. Yeah. You know, it, it breeds a certain, um, maybe not toughness. That, that's the thing. Cause I remember that chapter you're mentioning, Carlin kind of d- digs in and says like, how could we define it to begin with? Like, how could we measure toughness? Right. right. Mm-hmm. And you know, he, he gets at a kind of a quintessential question. Um, for people that read or study history, which is there are certain things we, we simply cannot empirically measure. measure. Mm-hmm. One of those, you know, being toughness, because it's like, to an extent, it will be subjective. Mm-hmm. Um, and to an extent, I mean, we can adapt. Um, but there's just too many variables. There's exactly there. There's too many variables. Like I, I remember growing up. So, you know, much of my family they're from Eastern Kentucky, and like you look at, you know, the divide between like rural cultures mm-hmm. and urban cultures. Rural folks will always say, "Oh, urban folks are you know they're softer." <laughs> Usually, that's they they equate that with the classical idea that like if you're around too much luxury mm-hmm. you know it it breeds a certain softness now once again you actually sit down with them and ask them what do you mean by that eh, they're going to give kind of subjective answers like what does soft mean mm-hmm. um and there's also the the whole there's a whole idea that like if you come from um tough once again we're, we're using this word tough if we're coming from harsher climates okay mm-hmm. that's going to breed a toughness right so like for example people from the mountains we always associate them with being stoic and you know stone-faced and they can tough it out you know and once again that's not just in the united states right that's a lot of places, but I mean, take the them out of their environment, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got someone living in the mountain, they're mm-hmm. probably used to maybe a little bit of cold. Yeah. You put them in the tropics, and <laughs> <laughs> they'll probably fall. <laughs> they'll melt a little. <laughs> you I always, know, I always so. joke about that. You know, me being from the quote unquote mountains, I love the cold, but you stick me in like hot humid weather like oh. like like in oh, pakistan I uh-huh. where i was born yeah <laughs> yeah but so dan carlin yeah he he gets into the psychology I, I will say if he had to write the book again i would have omitted 
the the psychology though because I, I feel like for readers that's going to be jarring because mm. you got like the first two chapters yep. you know what is toughness child rearing <laughs> and it's like oh here's the chronology yes um, here's the rise and fall of empires you mm-hmm. know yeah and the second thing once again if if people decide to pick up this book and read they'll probably find the end a little jarring so like I said, you know, he starts off the two chapters um, in the beginning of the book, kind of delving into human psychology. Then he starts on a chronological course, mm-hmm. you know, from like ancient examples of, you know, people thinking the end was near to more modern. But the thing is, is at the end of the book, he'll discuss the atomic age. He'll discuss like the Cold War, like the Kennedy years. Mm-hmm. Then he'll backtrack and talk about air power, um, the development of like aircraft, bomber fighters, all of that, which once again, I think some people may find that jarring. Do you remember why? Like, I feel like he did address why he went back. I don't know that I remember why. Mm -hmm. I didn't find that nearly as jarring as Mm -hmm. going from the psychology to just, you know, here's Mm -hmm. the history. Um, It it, it ties in together with the atomic age, right? I think part of it was to maybe show... So so I I remember now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got bombers, right? You've got, like, the first bombers that were built early, what, 1900? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Then you've got, like, the atomic bombs. So yeah. those are two very different beasts, right? Yeah. And so I think part of the reason was up until the nuclear age, you know, these conventional, we call them conventional, I'm putting air quotes here, conventional bombers yeah. were just a matter of course, right? Yeah. And it was it was just this juxtaposition of, you know, you go, you bomb a city and you level it, that's acceptable, Mm. or in warfare Mm. versus if you send your infantry troops your ground troops and they slash away at everybody that they encounter and burn buildings and destroy you know monuments and stuff as they go that's just that's anathema you can't do that that goes against the laws of warfare Mm. so i think that was one of the reasons why he kind of went backwards is you know you've got this horrible atomic threat now yeah um so, but back in the day, all we had to worry about were these bomber planes that would mm. drop, bomb, drop like normal bombs. Yeah, yeah. So, I think that's why he backtracked. I also now that I'm, now that I'm remembering, I, I believe he also was discussing um, the fact that when we developed, you know, what we call air power, so like an air force. Um, We tried to set limits on our development of those weapons, but we ended up just saying, you know what? Yeah, we drew the lawn, you know, the line in the sand. We We shouldn't cross. No, we exactly. We we skipped over it. Everybody did. I mean, the whole the whole country. What he's pointing out, I think, is we did that for air power, but so far. We've at least restrained ourselves when it comes to um, atomic uh, weapons. Yes, we did use um, the two in Japan, but after that point, we've never used it in like a major military engagement. And he's like basically remarking, he's like, it's surprising given the fact that we were hypocritical when it came to, oh, we'll, we'll restrain ourselves when it came to developing air power. And then we, you know, once again turned around and said, you know what, no, just, you know, go all out Mm -hmm. in developing and using it. But he's like, he's remarking, he's like, surprisingly though, we have been restrained when it came to the atomic weapons. Once again, yes, we've used two in Japan in World War II. After that, we would do tests, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States. Is. We never stopped developing, but we have we've restrained ourselves from actually using them militarily. Right, and I think one of the one of the most interesting stories in the book. It's interesting from like a forty five thousand feet away perspective because once again we never lived during this time. But um, 
you know, Kennedy, and I believe it was Khrushchev, Mm -hmm. you know, the, that moment with the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis where both leaders, despite their militaries telling them, hey, let's go go in, just launch, you know, Mm -hmm. launch the missiles, they both moved their hand away from the red button. Um, And I think, you know, another thing that I find interesting, but Carlin didn't really get into, was the influence of these moments in our history where it seemed like, once again, the end was near. How did that influence people socially? So, for example, I remember this from high school. We, you know, we would study like the Black Death and, you know, history class. And we would always talk about, you know, the, um, do you remember? I think it was called like the Dance Macabre. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the effects of the Black Death on like art at that period. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's almost like has the atomic age affected us in any way, like socially or culturally? Mm-hmm. You know, that's always kind of a... Well, it's it's definitely create. I mean, and the divide would have been there anyway. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you've got... You've got... I mean, there's always been the divide between America and Russia, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it was, you know, America and mm-hmm. the Soviet Union, America yeah. and the Russian Republic now. Yeah. It's, it's it, like, it's always, oh, we're here and they're over there. Yeah. And they're always going to be them, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but I mean, so, like, socially, culturally, like... Do you think it's affected us? You know, I feel like maybe in the seventies, like what they call the counterculture movement, may have been like an effect that the atomic age had on those people. Where it's like, I know this is maybe stereotyping, but you know, we called them like the hippies, right? And it was like, yeah. just don't care about anything, just enjoy life, because it was like you always had in a way, like an atomic guillotine hanging over your head. So it's right, like, you never just know. don't care. Just, mm-hmm. you know, the free love, the, the, the you know, people um, who grew up in America, they know the hippies. Uh, well, know. That, that's interesting that you bring that up. I think on a, on a global scale, mm-hmm. that's probably not super significant. Gotcha. And that's just what I think. Because mm-hmm. um, I don't really see, I, I don't hear, um, maybe it's just because we're in America and we're, we're, you know, cloistered off into our own little world, but yeah. you know, you don't hear that too too much mm. outside. Mm. You know, like I don't hear about I don't know Malaysian hippies <laughs> as an example. I I don't yeah, know. Yeah. You know, mm. so I think in the countries where that power, that atomic nuclear power, is largely concentrated, mm. and people are aware, like we have this, and yeah. somebody is always itching to use it. Mm. I think in those countries, maybe it would have affected more socially. But also, like, if you if you are the owners of the largest arsenal in the world, mm-hmm. then you you feel a sense of superiority over mm-hmm. others. Yeah. So that's that that I see as a bigger impact gotcha. globally. Mm-hmm. You know, more so than you know the live let live. We are all gonna die yeah. tomorrow <laughs> anyway. Um, so that superiority. Well, you know, I've got. I don't know how many hydrogen bombs mm. America has nestled away. Yeah, yeah. Um, one off of the Atlantic coast. Apparently it's rolling around in there. Uh-huh. Um, so I think in that sense, it has affected us socially mm. in a major way. Mm. All right, okay. Nice. All right. Any any other comments on the book? I, um, do we want to parallel the plague of... Bygone years to our COVID-19 yeah. situation. Again, yeah. uh, you know, I think this book came out just before, mm. you know, COVID-19 hit, yeah. you know, epic proportions. Mm. Um, but it's, in a way, it's humbling because the things that Dan Carlin talks about in terms of an epidemic globally, yeah. it's just, it's like I was reading and I'm like, he, he has to have, he like he, when this was published, he had to have known that COVID-19 was happening mm. because he was just writing with so much foresight and I thought about it and I thought, you know, that's just the human condition. Like that's how you're going to treat any epidemic. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. I think responses these days to epidemics like this are much different than they were, you know, for, for the, the, the black the Black Plague, he talked about how, you know, 
families would abandon whoever was sick because they're going to die, yeah. right? So you don't go near them. You don't get infected. Um, you know, you, you, you don't even in many cases give them like a proper burial. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. So, but we don't really see that happening here. I mean, to an extent, our rites and rituals of, you know, after death and funerary mm-hmm. processes have been greatly affected. Like for us as Muslims, we're not washing um, COVID-19 bodies. And I'm not yeah. sure maybe we're actually burying them closed up. I'm not sure now, I think, if the burial itself is closed yeah, with the casket. From from what I understand, yeah, I, I think um, no, you, you bring up a, a great point. Um, I don't think our genazes, besides the fact that, you know, we're, we're not, um, perhaps washing and like performing also on the bodies. I, I think outside of that, nothing much has changed. Mm-hmm. Um, but Carlin, he, he talks about, you know, with modern medicine, we are able to at least take, you know, preemptive measures when plagues are, are, you know, basically, you know, starting out, starting out. Developing. Whereas back then, it was all reactionary because mm-hmm. they didn't have the technology um, to, you know, understand. Well, number one, to understand, you know, germs and disease to begin with. So once again, what they were doing in the Black Death was all it, it was all in a reaction of a plague that has already been you know, far spread. Mm -hmm. Whereas for us, okay, with our technology, with their, you know, modes of communication, we can at least take certain preemptive measures as the pan, as a pandemic starts. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one thing, I feel like he, he touches on it. Um, when he talks about the black death that we still face. So the, the people that, encountered and dealt with the black death and people nowadays dealing with COVID-19 what we're dealing with in common is sort of like that social separation Mm -hmm. and you know he was describing how it affected so many civilizations because I mean once again you know as humans we're social creatures you know yeah we can we can you know separate to a point from the rest of society but that that complete isolation takes a toll on human beings just as it took a toll on people back then like you said you know families were separating people were were you know migrating out of towns and cities um like obviously you know, they had to, given um, what was going on back then with the Black Death and what is going on now mm-hmm. with COVID-19. But it, that also has effects on us. Yeah. That, well, we that... also have more than they did. You know, mm-hmm. we have social media. We have ways of interacting with each other mm-hmm. that don't involve us to risk risk our health to yeah. do so, which they exactly. did not. Yeah. Um, but the other interesting thing is the shift in this was a thing that he touched on is, is the black plague really allowed the, the peasantry Mm -hmm. for the lack of a better word to, you know, rise up because the the thing was this, this black plague, this thing Mm -hmm. was not discriminating. It doesn't matter if you were clergy as in part of the religious authority. It doesn't matter if you were part of the nobility. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter if you were part of the military. You, if you got it, you were dead. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so that was at the point at which, you know, the lower class realized, well, we're literally all the same. Mm-hmm. So that was also an in, an interesting social twist. Yeah, shift. socioeconomic shift. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that it, it doesn't run parallel with that, but, you know, one of the socioeconomic changes that is being debated, at least politically, is, you know, now peop- more and more people are, are arguing for, um, like a universal, you know, basic income. Because once again, these pandemics, both back then mm-hmm. and now, affect us economically. Yes. Um, so it's like now people are discussing, you know, we should have a universal basic income to serve as a safety net that can weather even, you know, pandemics like these. 
Um, and it's, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how our economy evolves due to COVID-19. You know, a lot of, a lot more jobs are becoming remote. Um, obviously, yeah, certain sectors are losing, Mm -hmm. um, jobs. Um, but then certain industries are evolving, um, because of COVID-19. That's, no, that was, that's a great point. Um, Anything else we missed? Um, no, I think, I think that covered it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I guess the takeaway from this book would be, it, you know, you, you can, you, you never know what will be, you know, the quote unquote, the end yeah, of yeah. a civilization. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it could be, it could be that maybe, Uh, you know environmental changes made it to where an entire you know society had Mm -hmm. to migrate Mm -hmm. and that's the end of life as they knew it and wherever they go Mm -hmm. you know whatever other peoples that they affect maybe it's not always negative you know sometimes it can be very very positive but still that's still an end of a life as you know it Mm -hmm. right so I, i yeah, and you don't get this 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 feeling until after you're done reading the book, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the end is always near. Oh, it's very scary and serious, and yeah. you know, ominous. But yeah. it's also like the end of something doesn't, you know, it doesn't always mean it's a horrible thing. Yeah. Um. Well, so you know, migrations and you know, immigrations. Mm-hmm. Um. That is also the end of a civilization. Mm-hmm. Um. In its own way, the beginning of another. And it could be a huge change in whatever other civilizations that they, that they affect. Mm. All right. Yeah, I definitely. Um, I recommend the read. Oh with yeah. A notepad, though. I needed a notepad to just kind of yeah. wrap my mind around because it's it's complex stuff, you know, that he discusses. He's he's very. Uh, it's it's very. What's the word I'm looking for? It's a very elevated. Oh yeah. You know, way of presenting. Essentially historical facts, but, Mm. you know. I I feel like, um, A, I definitely suggest this book, um, The End is Always Near. I will say, I do encourage, if if you're wanting to pick this book up um, for a light historical read, then pick pick up the book as it is. Um, If you're really wanting to dig into, like, the history that is touched upon in this book, I find that um, listening to his um, hardcore history podcast will help you kind of synthesize this information more. I feel like in a way he almost like, because he's a long form podcaster. So like long form is like typically like an hour to three hours. Oh, his or some of his are four to six hours. Mm -hmm. I noticed and I feel like, in a way, this this book almost serves as like footnotes yes. for a lot of his podcasts. And the book does have a lot of footnotes, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Just every page. Yeah. So I, I definitely, I recommend, if you want to get like the, the fullest experience out of this book, I definitely suggest um, listening to um, Hardcore History Podcast. Um, and I had I hadn't done that, so mm. I, I knew that he had the podcast. Yeah. Um, I didn't listen to any like I, I listened to maybe a few minutes here and there. Yeah. yeah. I didn't listen to like any one single full episode. Mm. Um, but I was still able to to follow the book gotcha. uh, appropriately, you know, yeah. well enough to understand just the general points he was trying to get across. Sounds he had cool. a lot. All right, so, all right. Well, I recommend the read. Thank you all for listening. This is Ichia 502, the Reading Between the Lines segment, and that is the end of our discussion of The End is Always Near by Dan Carlin. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Ichia 502 podcast. I hope you enjoyed our discussion on The End is Always Near by Dan Carlin. I want to close each Reading Between the Lines segment with a few book recommendations uh, for our community. So I have two books 
um, that I am recommending. Um, the first one is Mukhtasar al Akhdari. It is um, basically a manual on like the basic requirements um, for practicing Muslim for the Maliki Madhab. And then there is um, Al Maqasid, which is written by Imam Nawawi. Um, it is the same kind of book, but it's um, based in the Shafi'i Madhab. The third book for this recommendation is Centering Black Narratives. Uh, Black Muslim Nobles Among the Early Pious Muslims. This is written by Imam Dawood Walid. He's one of our foremost um, American Muslim scholars. He's based in uh, Michigan. I highly recommend this book. Uh, this basically serves as a series of biographies um, of early black Muslims. The fourth book is uh, Nur al-Uyun which is translates to The Light of the Eyes and it is a Sira, um, or biography of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the last book that I am recommending is Prophetic Wellbeing. It's 40 Hadiths on Healthy Living. Uh, this book um, is split um, 20 Hadiths on physical well-being and 20 Hadiths on mental well-being. I highly recommend each of these books. Most of them I have read. Um, we have a lot of great publishing houses um, that publish English translations of Islamic literature. And there's also a few um, very stellar Muslim translators here in the United States. Uh, two that come to mind is uh, Abdulaziz Soraka and Musa Ferber. Um, they translate a lot of classical Islamic liter literature into English, and um, we're going to be doing these book recommendations each episode of Reading Between the Lines. Thank you for listening, and Jazakallah Khairan. Salaamu Alaikum.